In this video, we will be starting our theories on grade 12 fourth quarter biology. Um, at least in our school, this is everything that we have uh, learned. They're all um, compiled in a single file of reviewer, uh, reviewer papers. Um, but this is not uh, complete yet. I still have to work on the vertebrates uh, lesson. That's the last lesson, by the way. So, yeah, but so far, uh, I already have everything else aside from that. Let's start. Um, so, with prokaryotes, um, they have these parts. So, there's a cell wall, a capsule, and a fimbriae. For a cell wall, this is not only limited to um, prokaryotes. Uh, it's also seen in plant cells, but not animal cells. So, usually, um, prokaryotes, or uh, in other words, bacteria, Bacteria, plant cells, and animal cells are usually compared um, in terms of uh, their organelles. So, um, yeah, let's start with the cell wall. The cell wall maintains the cell shape and the cell interior. It prevents cell bursting when taking up water. So, regarding this, uh, let's actually... Um, I want to show this to you. Uh, sorry. Um, tonicity. That's a word. So, basically, um, in this picture, um, what's being compared in terms of tonicity is the animal and plant cell. So, okay. Um, essentially, for a plant cell, of course, there's a cell wall. So, it's more likely to survive um, in extreme environment. So, normally, Plant cells uh, survive in a hypertonic solution. Uh, this is when they are plasmalized. But ideally, um, they're supposed to be exposed to water. Um, so, yeah, it has to be turgid. I think hypotonic, from the word hypo, that means um, the solute or th the number of, for example, salt or sugar is um really low compared to the amount of water so the ratio isn't even in that sense um so there's more water and that's good for a plant cell but if um if the condition is there's uh extremely insufficient water um the level of water is extremely insufficient then it's plasmalized so it's not a good thing but normally um like there are plants that uh, get exposed to water, but at the same time, there's a fair share of um, moments where um, it doesn't get exposed to water. So, yeah, this is their condition, flaccid. So, going back, uh, essentially the cell wall um, makes sure that plants, plant cells um, are safe from bursting. So, yeah. Um, Instead of bursting, they're just rigid. Um, in a kind of cell that doesn't have a cell wall, particularly the animal cell, there's a tendency for, for instance, a red blood cell to get lysed. Um, it basically explodes in that sense because there's too much water, too little salt. Well, not essentially salt, but uh, a relevant solute. So let's say uh, solvent is water then solute is the salt or sugar basically i hope i didn't um mismatch them i really do okay so the cell wall um is structurally strong um for the role that it uh does in prokaryotes uh and plant cells so at the same time, they have a semi-permeable surface for molecule passing or crossing. So, aside from what's usually called the plasma membrane, uh, for plant cells and prokaryote uh, cells, yeah, um, the cell wall still has um, a function similar to plasma membranes. Uh, only one way to find out what's the difference between a plasma membrane and the cell wall in this regard. And that um, I won't discuss anymore. Okay, um, what's the capsule? So 
it clings to surfaces and nutrients. Um, so this is so uh, so that the prokaryote prevents from drying out and moisture is uh, retained um, regardless of the circumstances, especially if uh, the environment isn't favorable. And yes, uh, there's fimbriae. Uh, it helps stick to surfaces. So it basically acts um, as an adhesive in that sense. Okay, so there's also a flagella. Uh, so this is for cell movement for a while. Okay, so yeah, how do prokaryotes perform cellular activities despite the absence of membrane bound organelles? So, speaking of what I mentioned earlier, something about plasma membranes. Uh, for prokaryotes, their plasma membrane is actually more enhanced in the sense that it caters what's supposed to be the function of membrane bound organelles, which prokaryotes do not have. So, complex mem plasma membranes. Uh, in other words, nucleoids, uh, they basically contain ge genetic information. So even if prokaryotes or bacteria uh, in general uh, usually lack uh, membrane-bound organelles, or um, I know there's another term for that, but anyways, um, yeah, this is just a term. Um, they still have genetic information. It's usually stored in the nucleus. So Nucleus is associated with the, with the word nucleoid. And at the same time, the nucleoid regulates cell growth, reproduction, and function, as well as um, regulate genetic processes. So particularly replication and transcription. I think transcription comes first, then replication. Um, more on this. Actually, I think this has already been tackled in the third quarter preparation video. Anyways, um, so it is composed of highly folded strands and, uh, yeah, more on the cytoplasm. The cytoplasm is the site of most biochemical reactions, uh, what you usually study during the first quarter, uh, protein synthesis, photosynthesis, cell division, aerobic respiration, cellular respiration. So yeah, you name it as well as metabolic pathways. How about the ribosome? So basically, the ribosome is the site of protein synthesis. Okay. So I suppose this part uh, talks about the various modes of nutrition of prokaryotes. So there are four uh, categories. We have uh, photoautotrophs, chemoautotrophs, photoheterotrophs, and chemoheterotrophs. So, how do we know, how do we distinguish each one from each other? Um, before that, let's go here first. Um, comparing prokaryotic DNA to eukaryotic DNA. So, yeah, um, we all know that eukaryotes are usually, um, like, they're associated with uh, more complex organisms such as humans. Prokaryotes, they're only limited to bacteria. So essentially, it's, I think it's uh, logical to say that prokaryotic DNA is, more, uh, is way smaller and it's more circular. Maybe it's easier to, under, uh, to understand that it's smaller. But yeah, uh, along with that is the fact that it's more circular. For eukaryotic DNA, it's larger. It's uh, found in the nucleus. Uh, the DNA is uh, considered linear, unlike um, for prokaryotic DNA, it's circular. And by the way, it's found in the cytoplasm. Regarding the location, um, I think this is one, one idea that I could um, give to you uh, uh, in terms of the reason why um, eukaryotic DNA is found in the nucleus and prokaryotic DNA is found only in the cytoplasm. I suppose it has something to do with uh, how they carry out their replication and transcription processes, basically their genetic processes. Um, for eukaryotic DNA, because they're more complex, they're larger, uh, more complex organisms, um, 
naturally there's a nucleus. But then for prokaryotes, we, again, from what was stated earlier, they have no membrane-bound organelles. And actually, the nucleus is one of them, I suppose. Let me confirm. There you go. So it is uh, confirmed that prokaryotes do not have a nucleus because uh, first, it's one of those membrane-bound organelles. And yeah, that's the reason why their complex plasma membrane tries to compensate for uh, partly the absence of a nucleus. So um, in replication for prokaryotic DNA, so it requires uh, one origin to replicate an ex sorry an entire genome, and what involved is only a single replication fork. So replication fork, uh, this term is more associated with uh, the lesson on how um, how DNA is synthesized. I think that uh, that's also a third quarter lesson. Uh, I think I already made a video of that. It's been a, it's been months since I uploaded it, I suppose. Anyways, um, for eukaryotic DNA, uh, in replication, multiple replication forks are involved. So, yeah, multiple replication forks, natural to associate it with the idea that eukaryotic DNA corresponds to, um, is found in more complex organisms. Okay. So, various modes of nutrition. Let's go to this flowchart so that it's um, understandable. I got this from the internet. I just wrote it uh, again so that it's easier to memorize. So, let's start here. So, does uh, the organism fix carbon? So, if it does, um, then it's there should be like this. I don't know if it's a prefix or suffix. But then there should be the word auto, auto. So yeah. What do you mean by fixing, uh, by the idea that it fixes carbon? Well, basically for, um, for certain prokaryotes, they um, photosynthesize. Hang on. Um, it, I know it has something to do with uh, photosynthesis because um, they basically absorb carbon dioxide from the environment. And yeah, that's the reason why uh, plants are useful. But what do, what do plants... Um, what's the relevance of plants in prokaryotes right now? I'm not certain. But then, yeah, I think it has something to do with auto. So, uh, yeah, if it doesn't, then it's hetero. Hetero, um, usually it's associated with the idea that um, these organisms are, uh, they basically get their energy from other sources aside from uh, carbon. So, yeah, um... Regarding sunlight, I think it has something to do with energy from light. So, if uh, regardless if the prokaryote type uh, fixes or does not fix carbon, as long as it gets energy from light, then there should be a prefix photo. So, photoautotroph uh, both fixes carbon and gets energy from light. Photoheterotroph both fix, uh, does not fix carbon but does get energy from light. So that's what photoheterotroph means. How about um, those that uh, still fix carbon, but then they also get energy from inorganic oxidation. Uh, so if they, uh, if they get energy from inorganic oxidation, then there is uh, automatically a prefix chemo. And then auto, if it uh, fixes carbon, if it doesn't, then hetero. So if, um, so essentially we already 
uh, tackled for of uh, the modes of nutrition of uh, prokaryotes if um, actually there's an extension but then yeah it's better if we stick to to the four the main four so um formally let's uh, talk about each one photoautotrophs they get energy from light and they do carbon fixation so for an example uh, we have cyanobacteria and some green purple sulfur bacteria uh, i'm not sure why i wrote this but then ah yes energy from light so i think this is the equation of photosynthesis six carbon dioxide molecules six uh, water molecules is equal to six oxygen molecules plus glucose so yeah essentially uh carbon fixation um okay just scrap what i just um started to say uh the plants uh well not plants photoautotroph prokaryotes uh get sorry i'm not sure if this is relevant for prokaryotes let's move on uh chemoautotrophs so they get energy from inorganic oxidation uh they undergo carbon fixation and yeah for instance there are um, some bacteria and archaea that fall under this category so chemoautotrophs live in zero sunlight environments that's for sure and photoheterotrophs uh, they get energy from light and they get organic carbon yeah um i suppose this is different from carbon fixation so for an example we have halophilic prokaryotes uh, some purple non-sulfur bacteria uh, some green non-sulfur bacteria and yeah that's it how about um chemoheterotrophs so chemoheterotrophs uh, get their energy from inorganic oxidation and they get organic carbon so this is the most common mode of nutrition for prokaryotes chemoheterotrophs so for instance what are those uh prokaryotes that fall under this category um a myriad of pathogens decomposers and symbiotic bacteria okay so like what i said earlier uh, energy from light then there, if that's uh, mentioned uh so basically there's a prefix photo already and if it does uh um do carbon fixation then there is the word auto if it does not undergo carbon fixation then the word is hetero instead and what is the energy if uh if it stated that it gets energy from inorganic oxidation basically instead of photosynthesis they undergo chemosynthesis uh chemical energy essentially then of course from the word chem the the prefix is chemo so yes uh, i suppose these um are the most common sources of energy for chemosynthesis i i think that's the reason why i wrote these random uh random symbols of compounds okay so what does it what does it mean if uh, a prokaryote undergoes carbon fixation so they assimilate inorganic carbon conversion to uh, organic compounds so what are these uh, organic compounds hmm. Mm, okay so the assimilation process uh, is intended for energy storage and biomolecule synthesis so yes uh, they oxidize sulfur iron or ammonia compounds for prokaryotes that do not uh, undergo carbon fixation they rely on organic compounds from the environment as a carbon source so they uh, source externally basically okay how how long is this gonna be? Dang, this is gonna be a lot. 
Okay, maybe we'll st uh, we'll finish this entire page, then we'll end the video. Okay, so prokaryotes, they're unicellular, and some of them aggregate in colonies. So the size is between 0 0.5 to 5 micrometers. So well, we have something called halobacterium. Uh, these kinds of prokaryotes can survive uh, in a salty environment. Um, there's something called bacteria rhodopsin. rhodopsin. Uh, they enable ATP provision for active transport. We all know that for active transport, um, this is for the transport of molecules when um, passive transport cannot uh, carry the uh, process out. It cannot transport uh, certain molecules because of um, inappropriate circumstances. Well, active transport requires ATP for it to work. So, yeah, bacteria rhodopsin um, provides the ATP. And to survive, uh, there is a need for more concentrated solute inside the cell. So what happens in this kind of active transport in the context of uh, relating to bacteria rhodopsin? So uh, there is a pumping of ions inside the cell um, so that there is a balance in concentration. Okay, what else? I think this is a uh, domain one of the domains in the uh, taxonomy of all organisms. So we have life domain. So domain, one of them is eukarya. Eukarya, under it, um, we have protists, fungi, plants, and animals. Maybe these are kingdoms, kingdom protista, kingdom fungi. I'm not sure, but I have a feeling that it's called kingdom, kingdom animalia. Okay, and then we have uh, prokaryotes here. So bacteria cell and archaea cell. What are the common shapes? We have cocci, spherical, in other words, bacilli, rod-shaped, spirilla, comma-like shapes to long coils. So they kind of look like worms from this image. Spirochetes, sorry, spirochetes, spirochetes. I'm not sure how to uh, pronounce this, but essentially corkscrew okay uh, how about the two types of prokaryotes we have the bacterial cell wall and the archaeal cell wall so for the bacterial cell wall um, the shape is maintained uh, prevent burst or lice in a hypotonic environment ah yes um, so the tendency if there is too little solute and there's too much water like what i said earlier in the vid in this vid, um, there's a tendency for bursting or exploding or lysing. But then, yes, uh, the cell wall is able to prevent that kind of uh, worst case scenario under normal circumstances. And in the event of plasmolysis, um, if there is too much salt or solute, but there's too little water at the same time, then the membrane will shrink from the wall. And yeah, this cell wall is made up of peptidoglycan. A peptidoglycan is composed of a sugar, sorry, sugar what? Sugar polymerase, I think, and polypeptides. Polypeptides relating to uh, a chain of amino acids, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah, basically proteins. For the RKL cell wall, um, th this kind of cell wall is made out of polysaccharides proteins and proteins, not peptidoglycan. So, yeah, there's a difference between peptidoglycan and what's uh, const what uh, pro uh, proteins and polysaccharides constitute in the making of an RKL cell wall. And yeah, majority that falls under this category, um, extremophiles. So extremophiles use this kind of cell wall, I suppose. And yes, endospore uh, preserve genetic material for dormancy reasons. Uh, sorry, for dormancy seasons. Uh, this is the, also partly the reason why um, there are certain viruses that 
um, may be removed from its uh, state of dormancy. Uh, usually, it's in the ice. Viruses that have existed thousands of years ago. So yes, um, just to mention that to you, uh, connecting that idea to what we're talking about right now. The endospore is a very important um, part for prokaryotes. It, I think it has something to do with uh, also the reproductive system. Endospores. Gametophyte, sporophyte. Yeah, that will be um, when we go to plants. But for now, um, yeah, I think that's it. Are we finished? Not yet. Um, let's cite some examples of prokaryotes, like specific ones. We have Dinococcus radiodurans. So these prokaryotes are capable of surviving 3 million rads of radiation. For Theo margarita namibensis, uh, so it's uh, usually nicknamed the giant prokaryote, the size is 750 micrometers. So if it's not the biggest prokaryote, then it's at least one of the biggest. Um, so, Picrophilus oshimae, it grows at a pH level of 0 0.03. This level is acidic enough to dissolve metals. And yeah, um, the ha what's the habit that for prokaryotes? Too cold or too hot, um, they can survive in those uh, scenarios. Uh, I think it has partly to do, partly something to do with um, its ability to be dormant if uh, the living circumstances are unfavorable. So that's one way that they cope uh, to cope um, in order to survive. And yeah, uh, they also live in rocks 3.2 kilometers below the Earth's surface. Okay, that's it for this video. Part 2 coming soon. Thanks for watching.